All right, I think we're ready to get going here. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Peter Singer. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've got some bio information. We'll give you a chance to clap in again in a second. Mm -hmm. Professor Peter Singer is the Ira W. DeCamp, Professor of Bioethics in the University Center for Human Values here at Princeton University. And he is also a laureate professor at the University of Melbourne in the Center for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics. He is one of the most well-known philosophers in the world, specializing on the topics of applied ethics, utilitarianism, animal rights, and effective altruism. You may know him from his widely known book published in 1975, Animal Liberation, which is a groundbreaking piece of literature often cited as laying the foundation for the animal rights movement. He has been an avid advocate for ending animal cruelty in 1980, he co-founded Animals Australia, an animal protection organization aiming to expose animal cruelty in places like trade canals and factory farms. The professor has also co-founded The Life You Can Save, a nonprofit dedicated, devoted to spreading his ideas about why we should be doing much more to improve the lives of people living in extreme poverty. He was appointed a Companion of the Order of Australia in 2012 for his commitment to bioethics and expanding communications about animal welfare and the battle towards ending global poverty. Please join me in welcoming Peter Singer. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, John, for that introduction, and I want to echo John's thanks to all of the people, except me, um, who have <laughs> been involved in um, making this possible. Uh, and I'm delighted that it's happening here. I think it's a, a great event for Princeton, and I love the way it brings together uh, research and uh, ethics and uh, advocacy and activism. So um, my job is to talk a little bit about uh, you know, 15 minutes, right, so this is a very brief run-through of uh, where the movement is uh, to set a bit of a framework for some of the things that we're going to be talking about in more detail. So, in order to say where the movement is today, I think it's important to say where it actually came from before we got to where we are today, uh, because that gives you a sense of how fundamental the changes are that we're already making and uh, hoping to make further progress with. So, just to flash back uh, to the beginning of the Western tradition, um, we have this verse in Genesis that I imagine you're all familiar with, the Dominion verse, uh, which claims that, uh, or you could say justifies, human dominion over all of the other animals. And uh, that starts off the uh, uh, Jewish and then Christian traditions taking that over. But if you look at the ancient Greek traditions, the other root of where Western thinking comes from, you find essentially a similar idea. Not the idea that God granted some permission, but rather that it's part of the natural order of things. That the universe, things exist in the universe for a purpose, and the purpose of plants is to nourish animals, and the purpose of animals is to nourish humans, and also to provide them with furs and uh, other things of that sort. So um, it's the same kind of idea that we are the pinnacle of creation, and everything else exists for us. Now, when you then move further into the medieval period, in uh, Europe, you find uh, Thomas Aquinas as the most influential thinker of that period, bringing these two traditions together. Um, Aristotle's work, just in, in, uh, Aquinas lived in the 13th century, Aristotle's work was just becoming known in the West, and Aquinas's real work was to combine that with the Christian traditions. And uh, as you can see on the question of the status of animals, they combine quite easily. You could cite the Dominion verse to show that Scripture said that we are entitled to rule over the animals, and he could cite Aristotle as saying that the animals exist for our sake. So he comes up with this 
really very extreme position, which is represented in this quote here, um, that nothing we do to animals is wrong as far as what it does to animals is concerned. Um, he says this in other ways, like, you know, in a more scholarly lecture, I could have given you other quotes. There are no sins towards animals. We can have sins towards our fellow humans. We can sin towards God. We can't sin toward animals. Um, they, simply, they simply don't count in themselves. The, the only slight amelioration of this position is the idea that if we are cruel to animals, we might develop a cruel disposition which would then lead us to be cruel to humans, something you probably often heard. But it's quite clear that in Aquinas that that's the only reason for not being cruel to animals, not because the animals are in pain or suffering or anything of that sort. And Aquinas was the dominant philosopher for many centuries in Christian and then after the Reformation in Catholic Europe. So um, he influenced uh, thinking right down to... Uh, the beginning of the 20th century, you can still find 20th century Catholic texts which um, essentially say <clears throat> the same kind of thing, that the only reason for not being cruel to animals is that uh, you might be cruel to humans. We have no duties as such to animals. So that's really where we uh, had to come from as recently as uh, around 100 years ago. And Kant didn't really help. Um, in that Kant is the 18th century German philosopher, had a somewhat similar view with a different, uh, different background to it, not appealing to God or teleology, but um, to the idea that humans are self-conscious, animals are not, and only self-conscious beings are ends in themselves. So Kant's famous idea that we should never treat any other human as a, merely a means to an end doesn't apply to animals. It's quite okay to treat animals as a means to an end. Um, not all Kantians, not all contemporary Kantians, I should say, fortunately, hold this view. Christine Korsgaard, who's perhaps the leading American Kantian, a professor at, at Harvard, um, specifically thinks that, uh, although in general she likes Kant's views on, on ethics, she thinks that here he made a clear mistake. Um, the mistake being, yes, you can't be a moral agent if you're not self-conscious, but that's not a reason for saying that we don't have duties to you or it doesn't matter uh, how we treat you. Okay, so this then begins to change, though. Around the same time, in fact, as Kant was writing, the end of the 18th century, uh, early 19th century, and it changes with the founding father of the utilitarian tradition, Jeremy Bentham, who in a famous footnote uh, in his introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, uh, considers a view like Kant's um, and actually says, refers to the French Revolution, which had just occurred, and it's uh, the fact that the French revolutionaries had recognised that the colour of a person's skin is not a reason for enslaving them. The French revolutionaries liberated the slaves in the French colonies. Um, and he says, perhaps one day humans will realise that the same is true about the... And then he mentions various anatomical differences between humans and non-human animals. Um, and then comes this line, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So uh, the uh, English utilitarians did start to push changes in legislation for animal welfare. And uh, later on that was bolstered by the change in thinking that came with Charles Darwin. Um, this is a remark he made in his notebooks, not published at the time, um, in the 1830s. Um, that uh, we have this view that we're so special in nature that we're created by a deity, but um, Darwin says, uh, truer to consider us created from animals. So, so the idea that we are kin with animals, that we are closer to them, starts with Darwin. He eventually published that and described it in uh, The Origin of Species and the Descent of Man several decades later. But he did also start the idea of comparing animals' feelings, particularly in The Descent of Man, with human feelings and suggesting that they're on a continuum. Okay, so that's where we came from. Where are we today, as far as the mainstream is concerned, not people in this room? Um, so the mainstream view seems to be, yes, we do have some duties to be kind to animals. It is wrong 
for the sake of the animals, to be cruel to them and cause them to suffer. So wanton cruelty is bad. I think that's generally accepted, in, uh, certainly in our society and in many societies around the world. But while animal interests count, they're not comparable to ours in how much they count, and their interests may be overridden, not by the desire to you know, sadistically torture them, but by so-called legitimate interests we may have, such as eating them or using them in research. And so uh, we condemn, again, speaking at least of uh, uh, Anglo cultures, we condemn this, the bullfight, because of the wanton cruelty we see, the enjoyment of cruelty, of suffering of the bull. Um, but we, uh, and we condemn this, which is uh, dogs being uh, captured and uh, going to be sold for meat in a Chinese market. Um, but we don't condemn this, which is a uh, young chick uh, being de-beaked before being placed in a, in a cage for uh, laying hens um, and for the, the breeding hens in the egg and poultry industry. Um, and this is being done all the time. Uh, it causes severe pain because the beak of a chick has lots of nerves in it. Um, that's how the, the hen will rel should relate to the environment, um, pecking at the ground and discovering what's good to eat and what's not. Um, uh, there's no anaesthetic used. Um, it clearly inflicts pain on the birds, uh, and it goes on um, by the million um, all the time. So uh, we don't condemn that, partly because people just don't know about it, but partly also because, well, it serves a legitimate purpose. We want to have eggs. I'm putting legitimate in quotes here, of course. We want to have eggs. Um, uh, if we keep their hens so crowded, if we don't cut off the end of their beak, they're going to peck each other and kill each other. So it's part of the commercial process of producing eggs cheaply. What should we have as an ethic? Um, this is the ethic that I first set out in uh, Animal Liberation, um, and I haven't seen any good arguments against it uh, over the years, I'm pleased to say. So um, I'm still sticking to it, and um, I do think there's wider acceptance of it. It's the idea that we ought to give equal consideration to similar interests, irrespective of the species of the being whose interests they are. So um, just as we reject racism and uh, sexism as discounting the interests of members of one particular group uh, defined in those ways, so the fact that a being is a member of a different species is not in itself a reason for thinking that uh, its, pain, its pains or his or her pains matter less than those of members of our species. Right. Well, the question that we're talking about today is uh, effective animal advocacy. Um, can we make a difference? Can we be effective in standing up for animals and trying to change the situation that they're in? Um, and I think the answer is yes, we can, and yes, we are. Um, and I also think that uh, in terms of the focus, uh, it's really been very good over the last few years that the movement has been focused primarily <coughs> on farm animal suffering. So let me look at, at that, uh, why that's uh, so, and the differences that we've been making. So <coughs> we should focus on farm animals essentially because the numbers count, um, and the numbers uh, show that the use of animals for food dominates other uses that we make of animals. Uh, if you look at the number of vertebrate animals killed uh, annually in research worldwide, uh, estimates are pretty difficult to get actually, but 100 million might be a reasonably good estimate of that. If you look at the number of vertebrate land animals alone killed annually in food production worldwide, it's uh, around 60 billion, maybe it's 65 billion. Uh, that's from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. So we're talking about 600 times more animals, uh, more vertebrate land animals used in the food industry than um, used in research. And clearly that is a powerful reason why we should focus on that, uh, especially when we consider that their suffering may actually be greater in that it's more drawn out, it's constant, um, 
rather as compared to animals used in research. And uh, here's a graph that uh, some figures that I owe to uh, Harish Sethu, who's here in the audience with us today, and who talked about uh, yes, very well deserved. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, and who talked about a bit about numbers uh, already yesterday afternoon. These are slightly different figures because what we're talking about here in this large chart, uh, this large circle, is just chickens um, and just the number who suffer to death each year. Uh, Harish, for those of you who were here yesterday, Harish gave a figure of the much larger figure of the number of chickens who die, who are hatched but don't make it to slaughter. Um, that was 450 something million. Um, but uh, this is a more specific figure relating to those who we know don't make it because they are dying a death that involves suffering because of their conditions. Uh, for example, because uh, broiler chickens are bred to grow so fast that, uh, and put on weight so fast that their immature leg bones cannot really properly support their body weight and it's therefore relatively common, I mean, we're talking about you know, 139 million, that's a very large figure, it's still a small fraction of the uh, 9 billion chickens that are uh, bred each year. Um, but uh, uh, these, are, these are, for example, birds whose legs collapse under them um, when, uh, because they can't bear their weight, and if they're not in close proximity to food or water, which comes usually down the chicken shed in uh, long lines of pipes or conveyors. So if their legs collapse when they can't reach that, they're simply going to die of thirst, um, uh, thirst or, or hunger because they can't get to food or water. And they'll get no veterinary attention. I mean, they're just not worth paying a vet to walk through the shed and look for them or anybody else. You know, there might be one person who walks through the shed once a day and picks up the corpses, but they're not going to get any kind of assistance or even more humane death in most cases. So um, it's that kind of death that we're talking about here, a slow, painful death. Um, and we're talking about um, close to uh, 140 million. And we compare that with this chart, which is the number of animals killed in shelters, killed for fur, and killed in laboratories. These are US figures um, combined, added together. So we have... Um, sort of more than five times, close to six times as many animals suffering to death um, in uh, just chickens alone, not even thinking about pigs and other factory farmed animals, um, as compared to those three areas. So it makes it pretty clear, I think, that this is where the movement, uh, the movement is rightly focused now on these issues. Um, but we are making progress. Um, we have definitely been making progress in changing these things. Um, I realised when I looked at this slide, by the way, that I just added Massachusetts to bring it up to date, but somehow I left out California, which had been there before. So it should read that uh, these cages that you see here, standard laying cages for hens, are banned in the European Union, all 28 nations, 450 million people, um, and banned in California, um, and are now being phased out in Massachusetts, thanks to the successful referendum last week, uh, and uh, being phased out by McDonald's, Walmarts, and about 200 other retailers and providers. So that's an example of the kinds of things that we are starting to do to make really significant changes. Uh, similarly, with other examples of, of the worst forms of factory farm confinement, um, pigs, uh, these are breeding sows in stalls, uh, again, banned in the European Union, California being phased out by McDonald's and now being phased out in Massachusetts. Uh, veal calves, um, again, pretty similar. A uh, number, a few other states as well that uh, have bans here and uh, Massachusetts, I guess, is phasing out uh, here as well. And indeed, the American Veal Producers Association have uh, recommended that this method should no longer be used, I think, uh, as from next year. So these three forms of confinement that I've shown you now, uh, veal, breeding sows, and uh, laying hens, battery hens, were the things that I focused on most particularly in the discussion of farming in animal liberation, because they were, uh, to some extent that they still exist, still are, 
the closest and worst forms of confinement. Um, and I think it's significant that large parts of the world have got rid of them or are in the process of getting rid of them. So this is really important progress. And you know, people often ask me, uh, what did I expect to happen when I published Animal Liberation more than 40 years ago? Um, honestly, I didn't know. Um, but uh, uh, on the one hand, I thought, wow, you know, it's so obvious when people read about the terrible things we do to animals and realize that uh, we just had no justification for treating animals like that, um, that everybody will just say, I'm going to boycott that and the whole factory farming industry will collapse. That was my naive... Uh, um, <laughs> My, my naive view of, of what might happen. Uh, I was still in my 20s when this was published, so I guess uh, not enough experience of sober reality. But I still did, in a way, realize people would tell me, um, you know, these are vast industries, right? These are enormous industries with uh, incredible revenue. They will defend themselves. They will spend a lot on propaganda and advertising, and they do. Um, and how are we ever going to change this? Uh, well, so we're somewhere in the middle of those two positions. We uh, have take, tackled these huge industries and we have forced them to change in uh, large areas. Uh, but, um, of course, we haven't done enough at all. Uh, we have started, well, I don't know whether it's the animal movement or the environmental movement or the health movement, but we have started to reduce American meat consumption uh, around 2008 or 9. Um, it started to drop off. Beef dropped off a long time ago, but chicken was making up for that. But now chicken is dropping off as well, and, uh, and pork. So we have started to uh, at least top out and maybe decline American meat production. Um, so that's good. But speciesism still prevails. And I should say, just going back to the meat uh, question, um, this is we're talking about the United States and, and Europe and so on. That's kind of balanced by what's been happening in China because of increased prosperity there. So um, uh, unfortunately, worldwide, meat consumption is rising, China, India, other countries. But um, hopefully, at some point, we will start to make progress there as well. But let me just say, some of the work that we've got to do, um, where speciesism is still uh, powerful, I've been talking about broiler chickens and about the suffering that they experience. Um, According to Professor John Webster of the University of Bristol, uh, the worst thing we do to animals is, is this, the most suffering that humans inflict on animals is the intensive chicken industry, because even those that don't suffer to death in the way I described, uh, about a third of them, Professor Webster says, are in constant pain, similar to arthritic pain, because of their weight and the fact that their legs don't really handle it. Um, and they can't just sit down on the litter because the litter is full of their droppings and therefore full of ammonia, and they get burns on their hocks if they were just to stay sitting on the litter. So um, uh, this is perhaps the thing that we need to do most of, and again, in terms of numbers, it's, it's the largest. It, again, it dwarfs the other areas that I've talked about. But I was very pleased to learn when I... Um, talked about this area at the Future of Food conference that the Humane Society of the US organized in, in Washington not long ago, that there are various moves now being made, and I think it was mentioned again uh, yesterday, that uh, there are moves being made, uh, campaigns against Aramark and Compass, uh, major food service providers, um, to get them to make some changes here. For example, having slower growing chickens uh, whose weight will put on weight more slowly and whose legs will therefore be more mature and better able to support their weight. Um, let's certainly hope that that spreads, but this is a difficult one, um, and I think it's going to take a lot, a lot of work uh, to really change this industry. And it's, it's not only the slower growing things that, that need change, um, just the whole nature of this kind of mass chicken production, the fact that they're so inexpensive that they're just commodities, that the individual well-being doesn't really matter at all. Um, all of these things are problems to getting any kind of decent welfare consideration for chickens. Um, and uh, pigs too, even if we've made progress on the breeding sows, uh, the mothers of the pigs you see here, um, we haven't made progress in terms of how the pigs who are being 
uh, raised for, for their meat, their bacon and ham, pork, um, are living. They're still very crowded conditions. They still have really no enrichment in most of these places. These are uh, intelligent animals who normally would be doing a lot of different things. Um, so, uh, you know, any, any pig farmer who's had pigs outside or given them enrichment knows that they're very active exploring their environment. They can't do that here. So I think there's no doubt that they are basically pretty miserable animals and we haven't yet changed that. Um, and as far as the mothers are concerned, going back to the breeding size, although we are phasing out the, um, the, the stalls in which they live when they're pregnant, the farrowing stalls, uh, we always invent these new different words we have for, for what animals do as compared to humans, what humans do. So farrowing is giving birth and um, uh, the stalls in which they, they give birth and then suckle their young, feed, uh, feed their young. Um, are still uh, closely confined and basically they can't look after them as they would want to do and if you gave them straw in a large area they would build a nest and look after them properly. They can't do that so we haven't made progress there. Um, and since Thanksgiving is coming up um, we haven't really made progress on uh, turkeys which is a somewhat similar situation to the chickens that I've shown you except for one more thing that I'll uh, Mention, um, and if you do have friends who are still just buying factory farmed turkey for Thanksgiving, um, you can point out that those turkeys can't actually breed. Um, the modern factory farmed turkey is incapable of mating because the breeding has created this very large breast because that's the part of the bird that most people want to eat. So the male is simply not capable of copulating with the female. And as a result, all of these factory farmed turkeys are uh, the result of someone doing this. What you're seeing here is somebody artificially inseminating the female turkey with semen, which of course someone else has first collected, uh, masturbated the male turkey, collected the semen, um, and uh, put it in this little uh, container, which is then squirted with an air pressure hose um, into the female. Um, and that's, uh, that's a very... Um, work that's done under great pressure by lowly paid workers, um, the, uh, particularly the, uh, the female birds hate this having done to them. Um, I know about this because I wrote a book called The Ethics of What We Eat with Jim Mason and Jim actually decided to find out for himself what it was like so he got a job doing this. He lasted one day, that was you know, that all he needed. Uh, he said it was the hardest, dirtiest, um, uh, most unpleasant day's work that he'd ever done. Um, and he is a lawyer, apart from uh, this. So, <laughs> um, but um, but you know, you're under, you're under great pressure to do this as fast as you can. And uh, again, it's it's something that a lot of people obviously don't know about. So um, I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, we I've, uh, I've pointed out some of the things that we've achieved, and I think that's positive. We've got to look at the progress that we've made. It's really terrific that we've made that progress, and I. Congratulate all of you who've been part of it, and I know there are people in this room who've been an important part of that progress. Um, there is still a long way to go, and we still need to build this movement, and it's still going to have uh, ups and downs, I'm sure. We're still going to face uh, a lot of opposition, but um, I think we can do it, and I'm looking forward in the rest of today to learning uh, about new ways in which we can do it. Thank you very much.